Recode Radio presents Recode Decode, hosted by Kara Swisher. Hi, Stuart. Hi, Kara. How you doing? I am well. Thanks. Good. Thanks for coming on. The reason I had you is, uh, on this show for the first time is because you say wildly interesting things, which not everybody in Silicon Valley does, as you well know. Um, but let's talk a little bit about Slack. It's sort of come onto the scene in an unusual way. You start, I'm going to start with your background first, because it is not an enterprise, you're not an enterprise guy, although I've heard from venture capitalist Ben Horowitz that you've taken to wearing suits lately and, and much more serious looking. But you started off in consumer tech with Flickr, one of the creators of Flickr. Um, talk a little bit about your early career and why we're going to get to how you got to, to, to Slack, but what were you, when you started in the internet, what was your, what was your inspiration? Um, well, I first got online in 92. I showed up to university, got an account on the school's Unix system, and was kind of blown away. I was blown away by the ability to reach all these people that had gone away to different schools, and especially because I grew up in a pretty small town, Victoria, British Columbia, mm -hmm. about 300,000 people, that I could find all these people who were interested in whatever. Um, and for me, this is a little bit embarrassing, so this is 1992, um, is the band Fish, mm -hmm. um, who had barely broken out of Vermont, but I had a friend who knew them from going to school in New England. Do you know I was in a carpool with Trey Anastasio, but that's uh, another story. I, have, I did not know that. Yes, indeed. But let's uh, move on. But so no one in Victoria had heard of Fish, mm -hmm. but um, there was early online music sharing. So like instead of MP3s, it was cassette tapes that you dubbed and put into padded envelopes and traded with people. And actually back then, the, the Netflix of the internet, like the thing that used up the biggest source of traffic was rec.music.gdead. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, this, this world opened up to me and it, it was apparent that for other people too, no matter what they were into, whether it was like um, model train enthusiasts or breast cancer survivors, they could find their community. So... This is maybe a year or two before the web really started getting popular. And as the web started getting popular, I got into it. Um, I taught myself HTML. Uh, my summer job all the way through college was making web pages for people. And in 97... Were you a geek? Was it, was it, was it a particularly geeky person or you just were shy? Mm. Uh, <laughs> I don't, you don't have to be geek or shy to, yeah. to learn HTML. But um, I, uh, I was a geek when I was younger. You know, I was in the... Like, my second grade class was the first class to have computers in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, so whatever that was, 1979, 1980, something like that. I don't even know how old I am. Mm -hmm. um, and there was like a, a long interest there, although it, like teenage years I didn't really, didn't use computers at all. But it, the, the thing that was interesting to me was the power to connect people. Right. Um, and that was something that, you know, had gotten started then in the early days of email, early days of the internet. Um, and has just accelerated over the last couple decades. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really... Uh, I started reading this book on vacation called The End of Absence, mm -hmm. which is just that now we never have to be lonely. We never no. have to be out of contact with anyone. No, and, I, my, I always say my phone is my best friend. It's the yeah. best marriage I've ever had. <laughs> um, so you, so you, you, fast forward, you were doing this in college. How did you move into this space? It started to get pretty exciting around then in the, ni in the early 90s. Um, yeah, so 97, 98, I was in grad school. I was going to do a PhD in philosophy. I had just finished my master's, and I decided to drop out because a, a friend of mine got his degree um, and from the best school for philosophy at the time and got the, a terrible, terrible job with no job security, low pay, had to mm -hmm. move to Kentucky. Um, yeah, there's a big call for philosophers in our society, but go yeah. ahead. Um, and the alternative was to move to the Bay Area um, or otherwise get involved in tech. Right. And you know, the salaries were better, it was more exciting, it was this brand new thing. And this is kind of like the, the very start of the dot-com era. Mm -hmm. um, so I ended up at a design agency um, because it was such a chaotic time. I didn't really know anything, but I ended up the head of the design group okay. you know, within maybe a year of my first job in the, in the industry um, and kind of wrote it out from there. So there was... I you know, worked at the crash, um, started a company with a friend shortly after that was acquired in 2000 and. 2001 or maybe just 2000. Mm -hmm. um, and a couple of years later, started this company called Ludicorp to make a web-based massively multiplayer game. Right. Didn't work. So games were an early interest of yours. It was, has always been an interest, and then they morph into other things. It seems like every one of your companies was a game company that then became something entirely different. Yeah, and I think the part of that is just because um, they're terrible, terrible game companies. Uh, right. Terrible games that no one wanted to play. Okay. Because they were really about, like, the game was a substrate for social interaction. And okay. 
I think about my, my dad plays bridge, mm -hmm. and he wouldn't invite those same three people over his house just to do nothing. And he also doesn't like playing against the computer. There's something about the dynamic that gets created. And like, I like playing board games and stuff like that. But it's a dynamic between the people that gets created. It's like some trash-talking each other. It's competitive. Right. using a certain part of your brain that's really fun to use. Um, and we wanted to give people some context um, for social attraction in the But it didn't way. work. It's too high-minded. I mean, right. it's too hard to explain. People didn't get it. it a, a tiny subgroup of a subgroup of a subgroup of people really loved it, um, but too hard to explain and too hard to make it a business. But it morphed into Flickr. How did that happen? That happened um, because... So we started the company in the, the spring of 2002, um, so you remember dot com crash, yep. and then there was WorldCom, and there was Enron, mm -hmm. and then there was nine eleven. Right. So it was like the all time low point to start a company. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the Nasdaq was off eighty percent, S and P was off two thirds, something like that. No one wanted to invest in anything internet related, but especially not uh, consumer stuff. And of any consumer stuff, something frivolous like a game would not be the right. thing that people wanted right. to invest in. So we ran out of money, and we just the one. Person How much did you spend? I don't remember now, maybe like $200,000 or something right. like that. We had raised from friends and family and our savings. And the only person who was getting paid was the one who had kids at the time. Mm -hmm. And Flickr was just a last-ditch attempt to make something out of the technology we had already developed, but that would be quicker to complete. And, and what would it try to do the photo sharing? Is it just this was, hey, this is lying around in the closet and we'll use it? Well, um, yeah, so this was now God, uh, near the end of 2003. And so I had had a digital camera at this point for like a year and a half or two years, and they were just starting to become common. And it was, there's two things that were going on. One, I mean, first of all, the very first camera phones came out, although that wasn't a big driver. But it wasn't just that people started to get digital cameras. It was that the, like, the internet was fast enough to look at photos. So I'm like, so remember when it used to take yep, like a minute absolutely. or two for a, a photo to load? Um, the speed of, of the network and the kind of ubiquity of the devices and the form of camera phones and people switching to digital all were kind of happening at the same time. So it just seemed exciting. And it's hard to separate now. This is, you know, it's more than a decade later. What's, right. what's a post facto rationalization for why we did it versus what actually inspired us at the time? Um, but it, it seemed like there was an opportunity to do something totally different with photos that hadn't been done before, mm -hmm. which was add all the social context. Because otherwise they were just, you know, put into a shoebox, literally, and put into the closet right, and, right. and pulled out. Or you know, maybe photo albums that would be taken out for special events. Right. But not some or stored on a computer right. somewhere. Yeah. Is and that, that was actually, that was a big part of it, because when the storage medium was the same as the display medium, like when they were actual right. printed photographs in a shoebox, they, they were kind of easier to manage than when they were just abstract references in a hard drive. In these of, thumbnails. Yeah, like they weren't, and you couldn't even see them. Like you had a, you could hold a hard drive in your hand and not see any of the photographs it right. contained, so it became, um, in a way, harder to look at It them. was eye-opening at the time to see Flickr, because that's how you really didn't, there was, a, there was this period between photos where they were in a shoebox and then they were sort of on a hard drive that wasn't very satisfying usage case. Same thing with music and other things. Yeah, and, and to the extent that we can get people to talk about them, give them a title, comment on them, add tags, you know, make them favorites, stuff like that, that we could get all this information that would make it much more useful. Um, Bob Baxley, who's now the head of design at Pinterest, but was um, at Yahoo at the time Flickr was acquired by Yahoo, had a great line, which was, Flickr is a good place to be a photo. So if you were <laughs> going to be a photo, Flickr was, at the time, the best place to be a photo. So you sold relatively quickly to Yahoo. You had interest from Google, from what I remember. Yep. You had interest from a bunch of people. Why did you sell? Um, well, that was the advice at the time. And you know, it's the, first of all, it sounds insane to say this, but at the time, 25 million bucks was a lot of money. It was a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it sounds insane to say that because it is a lot of money. Yeah. It, the little digression, but I was talking to Chris Saka yeah. about four months ago, and um, someone else, doesn't matter who, had said that they were mad at some company for selling for just 10 million bucks, yeah. and, and how stupid they were, because the founders only made a couple hundred thousand dollars, and Chris said, my parents are great people, and they literally would have murdered someone for $600,000. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, it, Chris Saka's parents, Chris Saka is a well-known investor in lots yes. of things. Um, um, so it is just in in any sense a lot of money. Um, we had we had uh, Reed Hoffman as one of our investors and advisors, um, Esther Dyson, Brett Bollington, mm -hmm. so like a really kind of a crazy stellar group for that time. Mm -hmm. And their advice unanimously was to sell. Um, and part of it was because you don't know when another Asian currency crisis is going to hit or another right. nine eleven or something like that. And the rationale was you'll have the resources to do whatever you want to do next. 
Right. Um, and so hedge it a little bit. And so we did. What happened within Yahoo with you? Uh, you've been, you were well known, uh, tr some troubles there, like working in a big corporation. Uh, well, I mean, I found it very, very frustrating. I hadn't ever worked inside of a big company before. I'd done a lot of consulting work for huge corporations. But when you're a consultant, you only, you know, you have this narrow interface to a couple of people. Right. Um, suddenly being inside and seeing how the sausage was made and the the length of time it took to have decisions um, to to you know actually do something that would have some outward impact mm -hmm. it's, it's tough coming from a nine person company where right. you can decide something in the morning and code it and then release it in the afternoon to this really long cycle um, which Yahoo is very well known for correct yeah, <laughs> yeah. and it was I mean uh, you are the Maybe not anymore because it's less interesting. But you were the the Yahoo expert mm -hmm. in the, uh, the whole world, and you remember that time, um, two thousand and four. It was actually an exciting company. I mean, they were doing yes. interesting things. Absolutely, um, personalization. Yeah, like I mean, that. it's still the point where they were a, a bigger and more profitable. I, company I just met Google. someone the other day who uses my Yahoo still. <laughs> it was innovative at the time. People yeah. laugh at it, but it was suit. suit. Well, it, and you know, like the, there was a, a team of people who were like who seemed really committed to. Um, using that advantage that they had and using all the people power to create a whole bunch of new and interesting things. But it was also, and this is a problem with most big companies, is just competing fiefdoms. You know, that right. the actual, the people who had the power to, um, to control what got done to the company were constantly battling each other. Right, which, yeah. is, which is typical. So you left. You yeah. left and then tried to start another game company. Yes. And tried to do exactly the same thing with uh, three of the other people who were on the original Flickr team. Yeah, isn't that the definition of lunacy, to try to do the exact same thing and hope for a different outcome? Yeah, it yeah. is. But uh, you get to do it twice. Yeah. I think. This is really the third time. Yeah, you know, okay, I'm yeah. waiting for that. So you, so you created this company. I went up to Vancouver to see it, um, another gaming company and called Glitch. Mm -hmm. Huge funding. How much money did you raise now? We raised 17 and a half million bucks. Right. Compared to the uh, maybe half a million that we raised for Flickr. Right. So you go up there, great hopes. What happened? Because there were a lot of gaming companies at the time. Yeah. Well, I mean, a couple of things happened. So, for, I mean, first of all, it was, I don't want to say that it was a bad game. There's mm -hmm. a lot of people who really liked it. Right. Um, but it was, again, just too hard to explain, too right. high-minded, not, you know, um, Especially because at the time, what was getting popular was Farmville. Farmville, and the vampires. Like, and then like Cityville and Petville and Plants Fishville. And vampires and, or something. Yeah. Zombies or whatever. All that kind of stuff. But then the point was, it was really, really simple games that just from hearing the name of it, you could guess what it was. Mm -hmm. And if, when someone asked us what Glitch was, we we're like, okay, well, sit down for a second because it doesn't take me about 25 minutes mm -hmm. to explain to you. Um, but also, critically, we started developing it using Flash as the front end technology is the client technology right at a moment when flash is about to die right we nice, were committed nice to desktop um right at the moment when people's discretionary computing time switched from desktop to mobile i mean this was early 2009 so it wasn't right it wasn't as clear where right things but were going. steve jobs had declared flash dead yeah I mean, maybe like i don't know nine nine months or a year after we yeah. got started and invested all this technology then steve said no no more um but yeah i think ultimately it just wasn't it wasn't something that was ever going to justify. So how much of your money did you spend before you got to Slack? We spent about $12 million. So we had $5 well, million left. And you called your venture capitalists, this is Ben, told me on stage, Ben Horowitz from Andreessen and Horowitz, and said, this isn't working. We're going to give them the rest of the money back? Or what was the, what's that like when you have, like, what is clearly a failure and it is not working? I know they call it a pivot, but it's essentially a failure. Um, the... The relationship with the investors was the easy part. I mean, so the, it's fucking horrible. Sorry, I'm not sure if I'm That's okay. Go right ahead. Um, it's horrible because, um, I mean, for, it's, you know, it's humiliating. You have a reputation. You want people to, everyone wants to look like they're smart and mm -hmm. capable and, and stuff like that. But the horrible part is really we had hired all these people. You know, there's 45 people who worked at the company. Right. We ended up laying off 37 people. And I remember that morning... Um, getting up, you know, and saying like we're having an all hands, and getting up in front of the whole company and setting up the video conference to the other office, and then locking eyes with this guy who just had started like maybe three months before, and I was really pursuing him and um, got him to move to a new city. He had a two-year-old daughter. He bought a house. He's moving away from his in-laws who are helping take care of the kids. You know, just like how much of a disruption to someone's life that was, and then to say. Thank you for your faith in me. You no longer have a job. Right, right. Um, 
So that was, it was really, really hard. Mm -hmm. The good thing was we had a lot of support from the investors because they were, first of all, they didn't want the money back and they said, go do something else. Um, but also we had nothing to do and we had the money so we could spend, we spent like a month and a half or something like that, put up a, a portal with everyone's resumes and um so you're trying to find people jobs. Yeah. You thought that was it. That was what, we, what you were going to do. Yeah, now, so, and we ben, did. Ben says it offhand, like, oh, he had this office software, and then they decided. I think it's probably a little more complicated than that. You, you had. Oh, yeah, we had a long period of arguing about what we wanted to do next. What, what else did you want to do that wasn't Slack? Um, I'll, I don't remember all of them, but I'll, I remember the stupidest one. This is definitely, okay. this was my idea. Was, I'm sure I had a better characterization of it at the time, but it was an app that would just show you ads. So you remember, I think it was AdCritic, the website? Yeah, like yeah, the, yeah, yeah. So kind of like that. Mm -hmm. So it would encourage the development of ads that you actually wanted to watch. Okay, sort of like good good ads that they have those contests. Yeah, and then Buy Now button right. embedded in it. Um, so yeah, that, was a, that was a terrible, terrible idea. All right. So, you, so how did you settle on Slack? Well, we had built a whole bunch of stuff on top of an old technology called IRC, and uh, so a little bit of a long story. The details don't really matter. But we had been using it internally, and it wasn't ever a conscious decision of ours to do this. It just happened very organically and naturally. At the time we shut down the game, we had 45 people at the company. We had been operating for three and a half years, and we had 50 messages in our email archive, like our company-wide mm -hmm. email list. So one email every three weeks. Right. And that wasn't, you know, like I said, it wasn't a conscious decision that we made. It wasn't ideologically driven. It was just an artifact of the of us using IRC and all of our attention and all the communication happening in this way that was really positive for two reasons. One was transparency across the organization. So everyone could see what everyone else was talking about. So the engineers could see what the designers were talking about and the people doing level building could see what the technical operations team was doing and the issues that customer support was facing were visible to everyone. And the second one was when we hired someone, they had access to the whole archive, like everything that was available. And so you might have just had this experience, having been acquired by Vox, who are Slack users, yeah. that you can just open up these channels and scroll back. You, yeah. know, you could scroll back for... Which had been done by social... There's been a bunch of them, but, but Slack seems to have caught on in a way that's almost religious with the people who use it. What do you... Um, let's talk very quickly about enterprise, where that's going, because the enterprise has been sort of this very difficult place to not have consumer-type applications. This is probably the first one that was consumer-type, that felt like Facebook, it felt like something that, that people had been used to in the consumer space that was delightful to them uh, or, or useful and not a consumer, uh, not an, an enterprise level kind of thing. What were you trying to do there? Is that your goal? Um, when we started it, we, we made up this mission statement and it's still the one we have today, which is to make people's working lives simpler, more pleasant and more productive. So mm -hmm. I, one of the things that was crazy when I went to Yahoo was I got exposed to all this enterprise software that I had never used before. So mm -hmm. you, know, the, you know, the payroll system, benefits, um, vacation tracking software, the, Thing to the 401k, but also the intranet and um, backyard, which is kind of the portal to yep. all the internal stuff at Yahoo, which you probably had access yes, to. Yes, no, no, I, I, I cannot admit <laughs> or deny that. Um, but it was all just so terrible. Like, I, you know, it's kind of mind blowing. And there's probably many reasons for that. So, one is that consumer software attracts more people who want to work on it. And I think part of that is because people want to work on something that their friends use. Um, it's also that we use Slack. So from the beginning, we use it all day, every mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. And if you work on payroll processing software, there's a good chance that you'll never process payroll in your whole life. Mm -hmm. So like you have no empathy for the people who are doing this. You have no idea what the hell it is they actually do. Whereas we use software to communicate um, for many years in a very similar way to before we even started building Slack. Um, but once we built it, we knew, you know, we could put ourselves in the, in the shoes of our customers pretty easily because we... We're also our own customers. Um, well, what's wrong with enterprise software? With the, all those things, it's just awful to use, or what, was it an opportunity that you saw suddenly as it started to catch on? Because it's a very different. It really is. People are they they love their Slack. It's a really interesting phenomena. Yeah. So there's two things that I just mentioned. One is that like that building of an archive in a way that doesn't cost anyone anything. It's just the, the right. process of their regular communication. It's like you have knowledge management all of a sudden because you have search. You can. Everything goes into a message, um, and then the transparency. But there's another thing that we definitely did not anticipate, and we weren't thinking about, but we kind of stumbled into, which was over the last 20 years or so, um, there's been uh, this kind of fracturing of the vendors that yeah. companies get their software from. So it used to be that if you were a small, medium business, most of your software would come from Microsoft. And now 
you might use Zendesk for customer support, you might use GitHub for source control, you might be interacting with your customers on Twitter, there's five different people that do continuous integration testing, which wasn't even a thing that existed 20 years ago. Um, CRM existed 20 years ago, but it's a totally different thing in this post-Salesforce world. And um, there's you know, now 20 or 30 different services that you use, and in almost every respect is way better as a business customer. It's cheaper, it's simpler, it's more powerful, it's right. easier to use, easier to deploy and manage, and all of that stuff, except that nothing works with anything else. So if you have your developer issues in GitHub and you have your customer issues in Zendesk, there's no way to put those together. Right. And you can build an integration between those two, but you use 40 different things, and you're not going to use 40 squared different integrations, but messaging is the kind of fundamental thing that we use computers for, and it is the one application that everything else could feed into. But your, but your, your premise can't be, it doesn't suck, is not really a, is a consumer premise. What is it you think about Slack that differentiated from others? I mean, again, because I think people who use it have a certain uh, religious nature around it. It's really fascinating to watch them use it and, and create things? Is it just people want to talk, or what do you think is happening? I'm not sure if I can put my finger on like one particular feature that makes it that way, but it definitely was something that we consciously cultivated because here's our experience. We started developing it, we decided that we want to do it. Two months later, we had enough done that we could use it ourselves. Maybe two or three months after that, we said, okay, let's get some people to try this and let us know what they think. And we like were begging our friends at different companies to please try it. And it was a big commitment for them to make because they, you know, they have a lot of stuff they already have to do. Which at work. Email. They were doing largely email or texting or whatever. Yeah, um, but you know, they were they were busy. Like they don't have time to evaluate. And it's a big change. And the most important thing was it wasn't a decision that one person could make. It had to be a whole group. And mm-hmm. at the point that you're making the decision, Slack has no value. Like when you first set it up, if you're the very first person in there, you haven't invited anyone, so there's no messages for you to read. You can't send a message to anyone because no one else is there. No files have been uploaded. You can't search. Like it literally has zero value for you. And at that point, anyone on the team who's kind of a grump can just veto it and say, I'm not going to use this stupid thing. So we had a real um, problem in how to convince people, how to give the administrators the kind of ammunition they would need to convince people, um, and also how to gently draw them in. So we focused all of our effort on the new user experience, and I think that's what makes a difference. It's the Slack bot being very friendly and chitty chatty with you, and it it does feel like you're using a consumer service. Um, Do you think the enterprise companies have missed the boat here? That they that they were purposely being difficult to use, or how did you slip into this spot? I mean, well, I mean, enterprise is is so big. I mean, in the same way that that. um, This is a basic part of that communication between. That's the key part of a company. So here's. I wouldn't say that anyone missed it because they're dumb, but there's this interesting thing where this is not this was not a product category. I mean, maybe now it is, mm-hmm. um, but when we asked our customers, what did you use before Slack, 80% of them will say nothing. And of course they used stuff to communicate before, but they don't think of this as a, as a product category. If you were to start a sales team today, you would choose a CRM, like among the very, very first things you would do. And if you were to start an engineering team, you would choose a system for source control. Like you would just never get started without making that right. choice for that category of product. There is no category called internal communication tools in mm-hmm. most people's minds. So they don't make a decision about it. They just, you know, it's just, of course you're going to use email, but also, you know, with you and you and you, I'm going to use iMessage with you and you and you. It's Hangouts for some reason because you sent me a Facebook message seven years ago. You and me are using Facebook Messenger. And then there's six or seven people that it's Twitter DMs. And so it's kind of all over the place and fractured. And it'll be like that inside companies as well. Where do you imagine enterprise communications going then from here? People are copying you, obviously. Yeah, I think that... Um, that idea of a of, of transcript that's available to everyone with kind of this like living archive is something that people are not going to be able to live without. Um, and I think really critically, the idea that having every tool you use, every service you use, all come together in one place and have one search box for is something that's going to be incredibly powerful and valuable. So, so speaking of valuable, your yeah. valuation, what is it at now? Uh, 2.8 billion. 2.8. Why? How, do you have a lot of revenues? Um, we're actually doing pretty good, and it's, I mean the, the what's pretty good. We are at just under thirty million dollars in annual recurring revenue right now. Okay, but it's more but about still, the growth. Too, yeah, exactly. I mean, what? How do you look at valuation? You've been very funny about this idea that these valuations are just made up, I guess. Or what? What is it you said? Right there? Um, well, I mean, they're, it's exactly the same as art auctions or something right. like that. Like, how much is this painting worth? Is Van Gogh? It's worth whatever people are willing to pay for it. So, how much is our Slack shares worth? they're worth what people are willing to pay for them. Well, yeah, but that's like tulips in, uh, in it, Holland. It could be. It could be that people are overpaying. Right. Um, 
But uh, how do you look at it when you see this valuation? Like when you when you're raising money, how are you looking at it as an entrepreneur? Um, I'm looking at it in two ways. One, so there's there's some risk of the valuation getting too high because it, and any time that a valuation has to come down, it'll be painful for a whole bunch of different reasons. Um, but on the other hand, um, the philosophy has been make it inevitable. And so mm-hmm. having a couple hundred million dollars in the bank is a very helpful thing for a business to have. And capital has never been this cheap before. Right. And there will be uses for that in the future. And right now the use is just to preserve option value. Um, to like t- to let us have what is your to goal to go public or sell or do you feel like you're creating the new kind of company well, I mean everyone's fantasy yeah. is that you generate enough cash that and it's reliable enough of a business you can go to a bank and say hey I'd like to borrow 20 billion dollars and mm-hmm. buy out our investors and then just, um, pay off that debt and continue to run it independently but that's not likely to happen so much more likely is going public at some point going public do you you've gotten lots of offers to sell from what I understand yeah do you want to sell? No. But from the, because why? Because you've done that already. Because I've done it already and because, um, I mean, right now there's no reason for us to do that. We've been growing at 5% a week for a year and a half or something like that. It just it doesn't stop. And that, that kind of growth rate, this kind of conversion and retention of customers, growth in revenue is much faster than growth in expenses. There's no reason to. I and mean, it's kind of a dream business. Do you, um, we're going to finish up talking about what it's like to be an entrepreneur right now, but some of the things you've done wrong there, what do you think you've done wrong? I mean, first of all, threatening. Our entire staff wants you to have threading, and they're very adamant about this. Uh, well, there's lots of features that haven't been done okay. yet. I'm Such sure as those, dating, well, what? I don't know. Um, well, threading is one. Threading. We're, we're on the cusp of, re- this will sound insane, but bear with me for a second. All right. So, you know how people use faving on Twitter? It's like, yes. I saw this. And yeah. it, it can, and you get a... We would of, like some faving on that, yeah. Yeah. And you get this kind of social context. Structure. Yeah. Like either thank you, or I thought this was hilarious, or just, I don't have anything to say. Yeah, we had a former employee, Mike Isaac, who faved everything, and he was the fave bear. So yeah. anyway. We- um, Mike is a, is a very solid favor. And, mm-hmm. and so is Mark Andreessen. Mm-hmm. You know, like he'll fave anytime you tweet at him, he'll fave it. Well, he has no standards, but go ahead. <laughs> so people say it's like the humane read receipt. Um, I mean, that was something that was missing from Slack. And we were trying to decide what we would use for that. Would it be a thumbs up, a heart, a star, um, a check mark, something like that. And we realized all of those are in the standard emoji set. So we just let you attach any emoji to it. Uh, I see. A message. Okay. So I could attach the little dancing ladies or I could attach the poo to your message. Okay. And once I attach poo, yeah. other people can click on the poo and poo your message as well. I, you know, our civilization has really moved forward a lot with the, yes. the ability to attach poo to notes. That's really I, nice. I, I feel like I could take that to... Uh, I feel you should win the uh, Nobel Prize for that. Um, <laughs> but let's finish up by talking about, we've got about five more minutes, um, talking about being an entrepreneur today. What's the, what's the pressure like? I mean, here you were... You had a huge hit at the beginning of your career. Mm -hmm. You might have topped out then. A lot of entrepreneurs do that. Then you tried something else, which was a failure, which, as you said, was humiliating. And now you're like the toast of the town. Now you're the favorite person. You're Mm -hmm. in the Travis Kalanick area of of the club, essentially. What is that like? Tell me, what's the upside and downside of that, of being sort of licked up and down all day long by venture capitalists and others? Uh, Well, I mean, it's it's very flattering and it's nice. Um, It's also very useful, you know, like um, in the sense that I'm here doing this podcast with you, right? Mm-hmm. And so it could have been someone else in the seat doing the first podcast. But there's, um, there's a real sense of increasing returns. So like the further ahead you get, the further ahead you get. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would like to take advantage of that. Right. But I don't spend a lot, I mean, the, the pressure when you're failing is one kind of pressure. Which helps. is? Um, well, it's... Panic and I, fear. Yeah, panic and fear and... and, and um, it has a certain flavor to it, and then there's the same panic and fear, um, but with a different flavor when you're successful because it's like, holy shit, i got to take advantage of this while it's happening. Mm-hmm. We've got to hire the best people while we can. Um, we have to grow as quickly as we can. While we're everyone's sweetheart, we want to um, you know, make sure we don't pass up on any opportunities to raise money hire great people, attract good customers, get the press, you know, all of those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a, a different kind of pressure. So I don't spend a lot of time Are, are you and, Are you and worried reflecting. about the economy? This is sort of, you know, these valuations have been high before Facebook when mm-hmm. it was at 15 billion. I made fun of it. Now it's, what, 100 and whatever. It's worked out well for it. What, um, what are you worried? Are you worried about the economy? Do you think it's no, over? No, not really. I mean, so, I mean, it depends on what you mean. So I'm worried about the economy in the sense that uh, a, a really serious correction or downturn is going to have a negative impact on the lives of 
tens or hundreds of millions of people. So in that sense, yes. In terms of whether, whether Slack's going to be okay, not really, because um, about 55% of our users are outside the U.S. already. We're increasingly diversified. Slack is pretty cheap. And it costs 22 cents per person per day, so it's not something that businesses are likely to give up. In, if the economy goes bad, we're not especially dependent on startups. So like in terms of Slack's longevity, it doesn't really matter if there's a downturn or correction. In fact, in some respects, it would be the best possible thing that could happen to us. And again, I'm not wishing that on the world, but if suddenly you know, we could find office space in San Francisco, um, we could actually afford to acquire companies because they weren't all crazily marked up as well. Um, advertising rates would get cheaper, um, less competition for hiring, all those kinds of things would be, and especially if we're the ones that have $300 million in the bank, it would be a great position to be in. Right. So let me finish up. What would be a piece of advice that you'd give to an entrepreneur right now? I mean, now you're not saying you're the grand old man of it, but you have, you've had some experience. What would you, what's the thing that really you would do more of and what would you have corrected in of yourself? Hmm. That's, a, that's always a very tough one for me. Um, there's, you know, I'm not sure if this is something that, that I had, especially within me, um, that I had to correct, but there is something, I don't know, un, untoward or unpleasant about the Valley generally mm -hmm. um, when it's frothy, yeah. which is there's just a lot of people who want to make a lot of money. Right. And that's what it's about. And right. it's not, I don't mean that you should try to disguise it by saying it's some lofty, we're going to change the world right, and, yeah. and make it better bullshit. Chief change officer. That's yeah. always my favorite. Um, but if that's, if that's the reason you're doing this, you might as well be in finance. Mm -hmm. um, there should be something. Those horrible actually, devils over there, but go ahead. Yeah. Well, there's nothing wrong with that either. Yeah. But I mean, if, that's, if, if your goal is, is merely to make money. Right. Um, I really like making software, and I have for 20 years, and I work with a whole bunch of people who also really like it, and it's what we do. And it, you know, it could have been leather work mm -hmm. or, or tinsmithing, or it could have been whatever. You know, it could have been some other kind of craft in a right. different era. Um, and we're beyond lucky that it turns out that this particular craft is rewarded you know, completely out of proportion to anything else in the history of the world at this moment in time. Um, but it should be doing something that you really like. I mean, I, I really like working on Slack. It's very, it's great to work on something that almost everyone I know uses. I get all of the complaints. Do you feel like an enterprise guy now? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Do you like meeting with enterprise people? Um, it's, <laughs> they're all people. They're all people. They're, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, and last question. What do you, um, what do you really love right now in tech? One thing, briefly. One thing. Um, this will sound boring, but Google Maps or just mapping software in general, it's its one of those things that I, we will look back at at some point in the future, five years from now, 10 years from now, 100 years from now, as just like such a momentous change. Do you remember going on a road trip and yep. pulling to the gas pulling station? Pulling out the maps, and, yeah. yeah. I just threw them all out the other day. It was a very touching moment in my life. Yeah. yeah. Um, and now it's like you can see what time the store is open until, you yeah. know, and everything's phone number. And just like this information about the whole surface of the planet yeah. is something that we never had before, and it's just it's totally fascinating. The And, uh, you know, just the... We are the last generation of people, like you and me, mm -hmm. who will ever have experienced life before the internet yeah. and after the internet. And yeah. for, for everyone else, for our kids, for, and for every human. We are pioneers, Stuart. Now let's crawl into the coffin and go. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for being on uh, Red Chair, and we really appreciate it. All right, thank you.